This is Lesson 19 to the American Revolutionary Era from 1775 to 1789. And the question is, how and why did American colonists forge a new independent nation? So we get to spend a little time on the other side of the pond. This course is officially called European History. However, I like to think that if you live in America, no matter where you're from originally, you are uh, by default an inheritor of European history and Western civilization. So we're still dealing with College Board Topic 5.1. We're going to be doing that for a while, contextualizing the 18th century state, explaining the context in which the European states experienced crisis and conflict from 1648 to 1815. And as we said in the last lesson, the spread of scientific revolution concepts and practices and the Enlightenment's application of these concepts and practices to political, social, and ethical issues led to an increased but not unchallenged emphasis on reason in European culture. Revolution, war, and rebellion demonstrated the emotional power of mass politics and nationalism. We're going to see this slide a lot. We also talked about Britain's ascendancy, especially in the, with regard to the Seven Years' War. And we want to explain the the economic and political consequences of that rivalry between Britain and France from 1648 to 1815, we're still talking about it. We already said that the rivalry between Britain and France resulted in world wars fought both in Europe and in the colonies, with Britain supplanting France as the greatest European power. And it is amazing how much help we had from France. Most people have absolutely no idea how much France helped us in that war. It wasn't just a little bit. Place the 13 colonies, time frame 1775 to 1789 or so. Key concepts of the American Revolutionary Era still have the Seven Years' War. Also, we've got some other things called the, like the Proclamation Line, the Tea Act, the Coercive Acts, also known as the Intolerable Acts, and the Stamp Act. The cost to Britain for winning the Seven Years' War. The British literally won their way to near bankruptcy. Britain's national debt doubled as a result of the Seven Years' War from £75 million to £133 million. Their reasoning toward the colonies was something like this. We went to war for these territories, and we expect a return on our investment. We are already sending you an army to protect you. You're going to have to fund it through a nice, reasonable stamp act. A tax on all kinds of stationary products. A stamp on the product indicated that the tax had been paid. So the colonies were already really different from Britain. There was no powerful established church in the colonies. Religious freedom was taken for granted. Colonial assemblies made the important laws, and the right to vote was more widespread. There was greater social and economic equality in the American colonies, for free whites anyway. There was no hereditary nobility in the colonies. There were no peasant or serf classes. There was no feudal tradition. Small, independent farmers were the norm. So here comes the Stamp Act. In Britain, they already had a heavier Stamp Act. And the money from it was going to pay for the colony's own defense. But that didn't seem to make an impact. Colonies were still outraged. And it broke with the tradition of colonial oversight. That was one of the big problems they had with the Stamp Act. For decades, local colonial assemblies had made all the laws. They had basically run themselves. The British Parliament over there in England, uh, they had to approve these laws, but they seldom said no. They seldom overturned these laws. And so when the Stamp Act came, the outrage was so strong that the British Parliament was actually forced to repeal it. Hence, this commemorative teapot celebrating the Stamp Act's defeat. Then you have the proclamation line. Remember, there's a British perspective to this. The British said no settling west of the Appalachians. The British and the Americans 
had two conflicting attitudes about the proclamation line. The British attitude was this, look, we're strapped for cash as it is. We can't afford to find a bunch of skirmishes with the Indians and the French who are still out there. So we need you to stay east of the proclamation line and leave those people alone. The colonial attitude was this, we're squeezed for land as it is. We need territory for new settlers. And then you had the Tea Act. Ironically, the Tea Act was actually intended to be a good deal for the colonies. It caused the price of tea to go down rather than up. Tea was not grown in America. It was grown in India. The East India Company was having financial difficulties, and so the British government wanted to help the East India Company out and do the colonies a favor on the price of tea at the same time. Here's the plan. Allow the East India Company to ship directly to America without going to Britain first. Instead of the mercantilist policy of making all ships go through British and colonial merchants, they could ship directly to America. This cut out a ton of middlemen, saving lots of money. And this was going to reduce the price of tea in the colonies. And the British attitude was, hey, in return for giving you a great price on tea, we're just going to put a little tax on it. Everyone should be happy except these middlemen, some of whom were English, some of whom were American. Well, the colonies didn't like it anyway. Colonial tea merchants were taking a financial hit. And the colonists saw this as an excuse to sneak a new tax in on them. And it resulted in the Boston Tea Party. There were actually two of these, by the way. The Boston Tea Party was a huge financial loss for the East India Company. Here's a picture of a symbolic representation of what the British were doing to the colonies from the colonial point of view, of course. And this woman who's being mistreated is the colonies. Then you had, as a result of the, tea, of the Boston Tea Party, the Coercive Acts, also known as the Intolerable Acts. There were three related purposes to the British Parliament's passing of the Coercive Acts. Number one, to punish Massachusetts for the Boston Tea Party. Number two, to make an example of Massachusetts. And number three, to use Massachusetts to intimidate the other 12 colonies. The first of these coercive acts was the Boston Port Act. And this was basically a blockade of Boston Harbor until somebody was going to step up and pay for the lost tea. The second of the coercive acts was the Quebec Act. And this act enlarged the boundary of Quebec deep into the Ohio Valley and the Midwest. Remember, the British had taken Quebec from the French in the Seven Years' War. Quebec was still very French and very Catholic, and now the British were putting all of this attractive territory into the hands of these foreigners. Third act was the Quartering Act of 1774. Providing food and shelter to soldiers is expensive. Without quarters on land, British troops had to stay on their ships, which was unhealthy. Quartering acts are designed to make local governments absorb some of the costs of quartering and feeding British troops. Local governments tend to not want to pay these expenses out of their own budgets. And this is especially true if they don't feel the troops should be there in the first place. In the colonies, there was already a Quartering Act of 1765 in place. And if a local government could provide for the troops, that was fine. But if not, if they did not have those facilities, then that local government was required to find space in such places as inns, pubs, livery stables, abandoned homes, barns, or the homes of people who sold alcohol. However, some local colonial governments had refused to comply. And so the Quartering Act of 1774 gave the military governor the authority to enforce the Quartering Act of 1765 personally. 
And this brings us to the Massachusetts Governing Act. This was an attempt to punish and intimidate the people of Massachusetts. British General Thomas Gage became the military governor of the colony. All of Massachusetts' own government institutions were now restricted. And General Gage's opinion was this, and I'm quoting him, America is a mere bully from one end to the other, and the Bostonians by far the greatest bullies. The Administration of Justice Act. Under this law, if a royal official is charged with a, with a capital offense while quelling a rebellion, his trial could be transferred to a British court rather than a court in Massachusetts. And this gave the accused, of course, an opportunity to possibly escape justice completely. George Washington called the Administration of Justice Act the, quote, Murder Act. The military governor could also transfer the trials of rebellious colonists to British courts to ensure a conviction. The Coercive Acts resulted in the First Continental Congress of 1774. These colonies got together, and that First Continental Congress accomplished a few things. It created a compact among the colonies. It launched a very successful boycott of British goods. And it agreed to meet again the following year if the Coercive Acts were not repealed. In the meantime, the battles of Lexington and Concord sparked a war with Great Britain. All of this resulted in the Second Continental Congress of 1775. The Second Continental Congress eventually declared independence from Great Britain. It produced the Declaration of Independence, and it also went on the hunt for allies in Europe. Revenge for the Seven Years' War. France, the Dutch Republic, and Spain all wanted payback against Britain. All of them had lost big in the Seven Years' War. All of them hated Great Britain. Britain's trouble with the American colonies was a perfect opportunity to get some of that paid back. And so all three of them allied with America, and all of them declared war on Britain. The Declaration of Independence of 1776. This was, as you know, an extremely influential document throughout the world. It strongly reflected the ideas of John Locke. Locke had applied the scientific idea of natural laws to human society. But just as there are natural laws in the physical world, humans have natural rights that they get just by being human. In a society, you agree to give up some of those rights in order to get a government that will protect the rest of your rights. In the Declaration of Independence, and this is what John Locke said as well, the government really only has one job, to protect all of its citizens. Specifically, three things, to protect life, liberty, and property. And if a government fails to do this, then the people have a right to replace that government with one that will do this. And that brings us to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and John Locke. Rousseau took the idea of an agreement between the government and the governed a step further. Popular sovereignty, general will. Whenever people get together, there will be a natural general will among them. And that general will can be viewed as a single spirit that wants the common good and general well-being of everyone. The general will is trustworthy and reliable. And the government's job is to obey that general will. Rousseau was more into feelings than other Enlightenment thinkers. Not everyone feels this general will. And in some situations, not even the majority feels it. But it has a moral virtue to it that trumps the will of the mob. So the government and the governed will enter into a social contract or a social compact with each other. And this social contract can be revoked if the government disobeys the general will of the people. Adam Smith and John Locke. Adam Smith and John Locke, they lived very far apart. 
time-wise, but they both expressed similar ideas about the government's role, though they were not contemporaries. Smith applied the scientific idea of natural laws to economics. Just as there are natural laws that govern the physical world, there are economic laws that govern the market, as if an invisible hand were regulating it. And these laws include the law of competition, the law of division of labor, the law of the free market, and the law of economic self-interest. Mercantilism is bad in the long term because it violates these laws. Once again, the government has only one job, laissez-faire, hands off. Government should interfere with these economic laws as little as possible. Let the market regulate itself as much as possible, and you will have a more efficient, more effective, and healthier economy. Exceptions to the Declaration. Well, let's not go crazy on equality, as we've heard. Few people believe that men and women should have absolutely equal rights. Few believe that all races should have absolutely equal rights. And nobody believed in economic equality at all. Jefferson originally quoted Locke verbatim in his Declaration of Independence, writing, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Property. Slaves? But he was persuaded to change that to simply Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness in the final draft. Finally, the Treaty of Paris of 1783. The, the 1763 Treaty of Paris had ended the Seven Years' War, and the 1783 Treaty of Paris ended the American Revolution. We actually signed it with Britain without France being in on it, cutting them out of the deal because we didn't want to give them anything east of the Mississippi, which we took, as you can see on the map. The Treaty of Paris's terms were extremely favorable towards America. The British didn't really care at that point. After the, the disastrous Battle of Yorktown, they just wanted to get out of the war as soon as possible and move on.